Hello and welcome back to the podcast. Today I'm going to be interviewing Gilbert, who is calling in all the way from Amsterdam. Gilbert is the founder of a company called Mind Speaking, which focuses on soft skills for data scientists. And he's even written a book called People Skills for Analytical Thinkers. So this podcast episode is going to focus all about soft skills. If you have these soft skills, you can grow upwards within the hierarchy of an organization. Even in a recent podcast episode, one of the Tactical Thursday episodes, Dr. Hall said that hard skills get you to the door in terms of the interview, but soft skills get you through the door. And to give you a little context on that, he was talking about the interviewing process. So yes, absolutely get your hard skills up to snuff and up to date, but you need to be able to communicate those effectively. If you get any value out of this podcast episode, the best way that you can give back to us is if you're watching on YouTube, like this video, leave a comment, or even share it with your community. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, you can go to our How to Get an Analytics Job channel and leave a solid review for us. That being said, let's jump into the interview. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. So I'm thrilled with this guest because I personally want to have this conversation around people skills and soft skills for analysts and data scientists. So with us today, we have Gilbert, who is the founder of Mind Speaking, and he's actually written a whole book called People Skills for Analytical Thinkers. So Gilbert, how are you doing today? I'm just excited that you're here right now. Thanks a lot for, for the intro. I'm, I'm very excited as well. Looking forward to our conversation. And I think looking at your background and the work you're doing, the content that you've created, created I think we're gonna have a really interesting conversation about yeah, the more uh, different side of analytics maybe. We're gonna have conversations about conversations. How meta is that? <laughs> I like that. I like that. So I guess just give us a, a quick rundown of what is your argument? So you're, so what, what are you doing right now? Cause I, I do see a need for communicating data and that seems to be like a game changer or a, a, even a career amplifier for most people. Yeah. So what, what I'm, what the main thing is that I'm doing is to train and coach analytical people analytic type of people who are uh, lots of them working in the analytics space in the data space and what i found myself is that while presenting and communicating with people as an as an analyst working in in data is that many times i i screw up i failed because i thought i had all the logical arguments i thought i had all the data involved based on a powerpoint slide or in a in a report but I, I also discovered that many people did not use my, my insights and I was devastated because I thought I was going to make so much impact and present all these insights that would change the business, right? And then I, I saw that people were not acting upon that and that got me quite frustrated actually. And that got me thinking as well, like how can I, how, what, what, what should I change in my approach? so that people are convinced, so that people are using the insights and data products that I'm, that I'm creating. And in the last years, I've done a lot of research about these topics. I'm, I'm innately curious and passionate about psychology as well. I think that helps. And last year during the trip around the world, I was six months, six months abroad just before the Corona. Oh, uh, perfect. <laughs> so I've been very lucky to to come back in February. And during the trip, I started thinking more and having conversations with people. And slowly I started to write down what I would have wanted to know when I started my career. And a lot of those insights appear to be on soft skills and, and people skills. And I was planning to just write 10, 20 pages, but then starting writing and it just started to grow and grow. And at some point it was 50 pages and I thought, okay, no one is going to read 50 <laughs> pages from a PDF document. So what am I going to do? So slowly it started to grow into a book and I'm very happy to, to, to have written it. It was a really a good experience. I learned a ton myself as well. And yeah, the main argument is that 
apart from the, the analytical side that is of course important, the hard skills, the programming, the, the mathematics, that's the foundation of, of your, your job as in, in analytics. But what I discovered and what I, what I hear from many other analysts and leaders is that this other side, communication, collaboration, is crucial. Otherwise, your insights will never be uh, have any impact on the business. Right. Because I've noticed that, and well, this is so timely because I literally had this conversation with my students at Greensboro College yesterday. We were going over a case study in Tableau and we were talking about um, deal size and total sales as KPIs. And one of my students is a very gifted student. So he's, he's very, very high in intellect and is also like really good at design, which is such a crazy, awesome skill stack. And I'm, I don't think he realized it until he got into this case studies business analytics class where he could co kind of combine his analytical thinking with almost like art artistic design and creativity. But he was, uh, what we do every class is I have the students sit down and we call it the hot seat where you have to, I, I, I act and I improv as the interviewer and then they're, they're the interviewee. And he was trying to explain the case study back to me. And he immediately jumped into like this analytical frame. Like he was going deep into the math and all the specifics and the details. And I think that is the impulse for most people within the data science analytics space. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because I think many people are so eager to solve problems and to show their, um, their passion and their knowledge and spread it also in the team that people tend to forget, those people tend to forget that maybe it's better to do a step back first to look at the bigger picture, what, what are we actually trying to solve mm -hmm. and what is the other person in, in the room who, is, who may be less analytical and more emotionally driven looking for. Right. Yeah, so I think, I think many people tend to jump in quickly I have the same tendency as well. And sometimes I still do, of course, I still screw up. Yeah. And, but, but with a little bit of more awareness, I've also noticed that, that the results started to improve. And, and that's why I'm very passionate about these, uh, these types of topics, because I think in analytics, there's brilliant people and lots of, lots of, lots of those people are so, have so many good ideas, so many good analytical skills. That's why it's such a shame if, there, if those insights and ideas end up in the bin. Right. Well, so what I, this kind of, that, that conversation where I was like, look, you're going into your math frame. It's not what you do in an interview. I was like, um, I kind of brought up this anecdote. I've been watching this, um, this TV show called Designated Survivor. Have you ever, have you ever heard of that? I heard about it, but I've never seen it. So essentially the White House got blown up and this guy, he was the designated survivor of Congress, got pulled into the presidency and it's this whole mess. And he was addressing the people and he was like, well, he was practicing his speech to give to the people or, or, or writing it. And his press secretary said, look, you're going into a professor frame. You're doing statistics, studies, numbers. The American people don't want to hear that. They want to hear the very simple message that things are good and here's what it is not like well we've 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 done five studies on this and here's the out like i i what i'm telling my students is start with kind of here is the insight here is like the decision that needs to be made and then if the ceo or your manager whoever you're reporting to doesn't like it then you go into the math and show that like if they're kind of questioning your assumptions or something looks off then you can show them kind of like the deep dive, but that's not where you start. And it's funny because that, that student was like, I've, he's like, I've, I've just coasted through school and up until this point, I've never really felt challenged, but this is a major challenge for me because I can't, my mind wants to go directly in this direction. And you're saying, nope, don't go that way, go this way. And it's like, I, I like feeling, making my students feel uncomfortable, but I, in kind of a growth oriented way, like, put them outside of their comfort zone and let them kind of swim on their own for a bit. I mean, I'm there to kind of like facilitate and help, but I want them to kind of break down their own biases, so to speak. That's really cool. And I think it's fascinating that you start with your students already with these kind of topics, because where I see the most, the biggest gap actually is with people that just came out of university. They just came out of school and they have quite some technical knowledge, analytical knowledge, and then they start a career. 
and they miss these pieces that you just described. So I think it's I think it's cool that you already start right. the process much earlier. What 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 triggered you to to start it? And when did when did you start? <laughs> I scratched my own itch, so to speak. So in my, I, I got an MBA with concentration analytics and I felt like it came out of there. I don't want to besmirch my, you know, alma mater or anything, but I came out woefully unprepared. Um, but also too, I, I, I come at it from a very unique frame because I sold insurance door to door for three years before I went back to get my MBA with concentration analytics. So I think I'm, I don't know if a natural salesman exists, but my dad was a very successful salesman, kind of mentored me. Um, I tried to kind of follow in, in his footsteps and sell the insurance that he did. But that market that he made a killing in back in the 70s is kind of dried up. So that was, that was a big turning point in my life because I realized I need to get a skill. And what I didn't realize was that I can bring the skills that I already had to kind of stack on top of each other. Cool. That's cool, yeah. Because that, because many people see soft skills as a, as a different area, and of course it kind of is, but eventually it comes down to stacking those skills together and bringing, using your communication skills to to make your hard skills flourish. So if you if you've done a great analysis or you created a dashboard or whatever, and you can use those softer skills, those people skills to to make sure people understand it and people buy into it. Because that's also uh, something that I often see happening is that even when people get the, the requirements and the end goal that we just described, even when they have that clearly uh, stated down in the beginning, often business change, just changes, right? There's so many changes. It's, it's di different from academia where you do a project of three years and then at the end you have an academic paper and hopefully people will read it. Right. But uh, in business, the environment changes so quickly and people change their mind as well. And even though your project may be according to the requirements, if you worked in isolation for six weeks, then maybe after those six weeks, uh, the business manager or whoever you're creating the, um, the, the data product for, for uh, may change his or her mind and doesn't find it interesting anymore. Or, or on the way, there have been some obstacles that you, you did not discuss with that person. And, and then even though you clearly define the, the end goal, uh, it's still not a successful project. And I think, I think that's, a, that's such a shame. Interesting. I'm thinking about that. Okay, so let's segue into, do you have any tactical advice? Like, so I'm kind of being empathetic and trying to keep my audience in mind. What can someone do today, right, right after they get done listening to this interview, all the way through, for those of you who are listening, please, <laughs> what can they do to like boots on the ground, make that first step into improving their communication style or impact or however you want to frame that up? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think the first step is to, to gain a bit more, more knowledge and there's there's a ton of books out uh, out there in the world. There's one in uh, particular though, right? <laughs> yeah, well, there's <laughs> lots of good communication books. I, I've written a book, a book about communication for, for people's skill, for analytical thinkers as well. And what I think is most important is that you also take action because mm -hmm. I think many analytical thinkers, also like me, I like to gain a lot of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And well, that is great. It's, it's intellectual stimulation and you, you gain more awareness of, of, of all the different topics that you read about. If you don't take action, it's not going to work. Because if you learn about Python, right, you're going to read how you're programming a Python code. That's, that's great, but you also need to put it in practice. You need to, you need to learn and, and do it and make the mistakes. And I see you need to see the, do the same with, with people skills. And I think what, what makes it difficult because communication and people skills is, is a bit more uh, vulnerable because mm. I think me people yeah. uh, prefer to say that they work on their Python skills or R programming or Excel or whatever, prefer to say that instead of telling people uh, that you want to be more, more empathetic and presentation skills because many people are a bit ashamed if they don't have the social skills or whatever, but I think many people, even people with very good social skills, they say, yeah, well, I don't need to work on my people skills, but because I'm already there. 
And I don't believe in that. I, I believe everyone has a different starting point and some people have more talent. They grow quicker right. in, in, these, in this space. But um, I think everyone can grow. And so the first, the first step would be, so I, there's, there's three things I think how you can become more self-aware. Uh, the first is asking for feedback. And I've, I've had a lot of people in LinkedIn asking me via chat one-on-one, -on -one, like, how, how do I do that? How do I ask for feedback? Because it's quite daunting, right? Mm. How do you ask for feedback in a productive way that, which is not humiliate, humiliating? Because right. if, you ask, if you ask for feedback, it can feel a bit like saying, hey, what, what do you think about me? Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to separate yourself from your performance and you can you can ask people if you find it difficult i always advise people to start very very small so asking people what do you think about my performance in this meeting or what do you think about the presentation i did that's a bit more less daunting than asking what do you think about me as a person right that feels very vulnerable so that that's one the yeah. second one is is journaling that mm. made a big difference in my life and I heard it's the same for others. So what you do is you write down every day or every week, you have a short reflection about your, your week, what w went well, what didn't go so well, and also make some evaluations about people skills. So when did you have a really good connection with someone? And what exactly happened? What type of questions did you ask? Oh, I love that. Because you're yeah. sitting with it. I, I, I think that most people, especially people who are high in, um, neuroticism or they kind of throw out that nervous energy they just want to throw they, like they have a bad social ex um interaction and they just want to throw it out and not engage with it they just want to bury it in their mind but like sitting with that like discomfort that i don't know it, that ang anxiety and discomfort i think is a, is a really good tactic because you can kind of like think deeper like why was i anxious was it because i wanted something from this person or i needed their approval or I didn't feel ready for the meaning. I mean, I, I, I love that. That's, that's some great advice. Just sit with your uncomfortable feelings. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I think that's the, that's the reason why so many people do not do it because they don't want to. They prefer to indeed shove it away and let's go to the next interaction or something right. that's focused on something I like instead of sitting with this discomfort and discovering a bit more about myself. Well, so there's this uh, metaphor that I've heard that I think really, really kind of illustrates this point, like back in like medieval times, like in folklore, like where's the pot of gold in almost all the stories? It's in the dragon's den. So you have to kind of slay the dragon to get the gold. So in, in that metaphor, it's like you have to slay those like awkward, uncomfortable, you said something stupid, or it's like... Um, you know, you, you leave the room and you have the immediate right thing to say, but it's like you, you missed it in that moment. Um, just kind of sitting with that and being like, well, okay, well, if I just like calm myself, maybe that would have came like right in the moment. But okay, I, I love that. That's, that's really cool. I, I think that's where analytical types of people have, a, have an advantage because they're a bit more curious about what's happening and, and willing to analyze a bit deeper what's going on. So if you, if you can analyze uh, sales performance or create a dashboard or analyze whatever kind of, kind of data, you can, do, you can do the same with your own life and with your own days. So what, just writing down what, what was one thing that w went really well or what gave me energy and what was the thing that drained my energy. So for, for example, there was, when I started doing this so and after one month I had a list of people or, or things that drained my energy and that gave me energy. And yeah, one example of a thing that drained my energy was, was having lunch with, with, with one person. And I wasn't, I wasn't really aware of it, right? I was, I was only on the, on the surface. I, I could feel it was not a great lunch, but, but then after this, that, that insight, it sounds a bit stupid, but after that insight, I started to you know, hang out a bit more with other types of people during, uh, during work. And those people gave me energy. And those were also the people that stimulated me to, to grow and also allowed me to discuss these kinds of topics. So and, the and person just, enjoyable. were they just an energy vampire? Just super negative and like, yeah, 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 indeed. And, 
and I, I didn't have the uh, first of all the self-awareness and second of all the balls to say hey this is not what I'm gonna do but when that insight or self-awareness was bigger and I realized how much impact it had on me I also Man. knew okay, it's, it's time to take action awesome okay what was your third point you said you, this is two what was that what was that last one yeah the third one uh, well, good listening by the way <laughs> my, third, <laughs> my third point is is meditation and I'm all, that's always a point I'm a bit um, careful with because many people whether it's analytical types of people or other type of people there's a lot of there's a lot of stigma around meditation i think mm. i can only say for me it made made a big difference it made me much more self-aware of of my days it might get make made me much more um, energetic as well during um during my days because mm. when i heard about meditation i was like okay whatever right <laughs> soft soft and fluffy stuff it's not made for me you know Sh show me that it has value and you know, why, why would I just sit there for 10 minutes while there are so many interesting things uh, to do? So it felt very unproductive. Are you using an app? Have you heard of uh, Sam Harris's app? No, I do use an app, but I don't know that one. Um, it's like guided meditation. So he is a neuroscientist and he is like, I, I'm not quite sure if he's studying meditation on the brain, but like he's very well versed in the science behind it. So it feels a little bit, I know exactly what you're saying. It seems like new agey, frou-frou, like pretend. But I think that you can use it to kind of, because I, I get lost in my mind all the time. Yeah, I've, I've got like eight different things running and I, I, I don't kind of center myself enough. I usually kind of do, do it through working out, like kind of like, like walking meditation, so to speak. Um, but yeah, it's, that's, that's a struggle for me, sitting with my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. And I think it's a, it's a struggle for almost everyone because there's so many things in our heads and right. maybe analytical people in analytics even more. So many things we want to analyze and, and it's fantastic, right? There's so, many, so much information in the world, even if you sit on a bench on a, on a square in the city, there are so many people walking around and you could analyze everything. And... But yeah, but it's also important if you want to focus and you want to connect with someone, then you shouldn't think about anything else. Because if I'm, so tomorrow I have an important presentation and if I would be talking to you and thinking about the presentation all the time, I would not be present here with you. And right. I would not live well. And, and the same holds if you do, uh, if you perform an analysis or you write code or you talk to someone to get the requirements, if you're not there, then people will notice. And I think most analytical thinkers are more interested in, in the analytical side, of course. But I think if you give people the right uh, metaphors and the right language, then the thing I'm trying in with my book, then people will understand more. And I think then they're more triggered to, to take action as well. Wait, let's pause there because I did look through the table of contents because you sent me this like, I don't know, a day before this. So I haven't had a chance to get through the book. I love how you structured the chapters because you speak data in the book. I think one, one, one of the chapters named like mastering your own algorithm or something. Right. Yeah. What did, okay, that, that, I love that because it's so creative. And I think that you're speaking the right language. So you're bridging the gap between those who are only focused on hard skills and those who are, you know, a little bit more I guess, emotionally oriented or emotionally intelligent. So what, what, what was in that chapter? Cause I'm, I'm really curious about that. Yeah. So the chapter is about, I start in the beginning of my book, I start explaining how our brain works. And basically we have two types of brains. One is the limbic system. One is the neocortex. So the limbic system is more, is, is the feeling brain, the emotional brain. And on the other side, we have the neocortex, which is, which is the thinking brain. And the thinking brain is the more analytical one, the slower one. And on the other side, the emotional brain is, is really quick with, in, with the responses, but more driven yeah, by emotions, of course. And yeah, one of the metaphors that I use, we get to the, we'll get to the algorithm, is the elephant and the rider, because that's exactly how you can see those two parts of the brain. 
where the elephant right. or the rider is on top of the elephant and I've the elephant is the emotional brain. Yeah, it's a very mm. famous metaphor and I think it's very compelling. The, so the elephant is the, is the emotional brain and the rider on top of it is the rational brain. And the rider knows rationally where he needs to go, right? Mm. But the elephant, which is 40 times bigger as the, as the rider, <laughs> Is the emotional brain and also has has its impulses and even though the the rational rider knows where, where he wants to go he also needs to kind of tame the elephant the emotions and so that the the, the route that is taken is the right one and with, with this I, I i don't want to say you want to shove away all the all the emotions and mute all the emotions because even though the elephant is impulsive and sees something to eat left and right, um, sometimes this, this elephant also has a strong intuition. And mm. what I want to say is that there's, there's also some value in, in understanding your own emotions. And we, I think we made, make a lot of wrong decisions thanks to our emotions. We, we don't like to save, we don't like to invest money, we, we want to consume now rather today uh, than tomorrow. But, but there's also value, like when, when I described about journaling and discovering that this energy vampire, very negative, drained all my emotions, thanks to, the, th thanks to having that self-awareness about this feeling, I could make changes in my day. So that's the elephant and the rider. Now I'll come to the, the algorithm. How I position the algorithm metaphor is that in every situation you have a ton of data. So I'm sitting here with you and I get a lot of inf information from you. I know mm -hmm. about your background. I, I'm, I know what the conversation will be about approximately. And based on all the algorithms that I built in the past, in my childhood, in the last years, I have kind of built in responses. And that's, and that's the basis for an algorithm. And based on all the inputs, all the situational input, I produce uh, an output through my algorithms, and that is the behavior. And it sounds a bit abstract, but maybe I can make it a bit more concrete by showing, um, for example, if you, if you get home after a work day, imagine it's not Corona and you work right. the whole day, <laughs> come back, then the irrational brain knows, okay, I agreed with myself, I wanted to work out today, so let's do so. But then still your emotional brain is maybe a bit lazy and saying, well, I, ha I had a rough day, so let's, uh, let's take some rest. And that's how these, these uh, behavioral triggers come into play. And also in a, in a big meeting, maybe you're, thanks to the algorithms that you build, the behavior, maybe people told you to stay silent and, and not pitch your ideas, right? Not be the arrogant guy that uh, always, always uh, knows best. Right. Maybe people told you 100, 100 times and maybe at a very important moment in your childhood, then you will be tempted to stay silent when uh, you're in a meeting with, with senior people. Even though you have this big idea, you decide not to, not to speak up. It's like your internal script of, right. I don't do that. That is not who I am. It, it's really funny because I have the opposite impulse. When I'm uncomfortable, I take up more space. I get louder. I get, I feel the need to control and facilitate the room. Right. And that's served me to get to this point. But now that I've got like enough, are you familiar with Raval, uh, Naval Ravikant? Yeah, I know. So um, he talks about like different kinds of luck. Like I've hustled for years to get to this point where I'm at now. And I now have like three or four things kind of moving in the right direction. And I need to slow down and listen and think deeper as opposed to like, I have a very strong action bias, which seems like a good thing. And I think it has served me up until this point. But if I just start acting impulsively, I may burn bridges. I may like lose opportunity for new revenue streams or new partnerships or, you know, especially now that I'm a professor, I have to watch what I say. I'm not used to doing that. And I'm like, well, cause now I'm talking to, you know, younger people and it's in like a more 
I, I would say a more traditional and more professional setting. Cause like most of my friends are like entrepreneur buddies and like, we can talk about anything we want. There's not like this kind of, what would you call it? Like this corporate social culture. It's like, you know, we go out and have beers and we can do whatever. Um, it, I, I'm, I'm working through exactly what you're saying, where I'm like trying to recognize my bias. I call it bias. You, what did you call it? You call it something different. So I, I call it algorithm. So all the algorithms that you build, is that what you mean? I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. So I think when I say bias, it maps not one-to-one -one with when you say algorithm, but it's similar because I, because it's kind of like my frame or my heuristic for what reality is. Like, in my opinion, I'm the one who moves first. I'm the one who initiates. I'm the one who goes out and hunts and brings opportunity. Um, that's kind of like an algorithm, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because that, that's what you, that's what you build. Just like if you go to the, to the gym or you, you always introduce yourself when, when, when you meet people. Well, mm -hmm. with, again, with Corona, not anymore with a handshake, right. but those are all learned patterns. It, it starts from your, your very uh, beginning when you're, when you're young and you touch the oven once, you know, okay, don't do that anymore. Right. Right. It's right. Simple as that. And it's, it's all these l learned uh, um, algorithms or biases or triggers that make you uh, behave in a certain way. And I, I think that's what you're talking about. So it's your internal script that tells right. you do how to behave i think algorithm is more descriptive though than what i'm saying I, I, like bias doesn't bias isn't as like solid or strong i mean you wrote the book on this so i'm gonna follow your lead here i need to say i have how would i how would i talk about that to myself or to others like uh my algorithm is that i am more aggressive when i'm uncomfortable or unsure of things and i have a because i want to say action bias because that's that's like a that is for sure like a word that has implanted itself in my brain of like when you don't know what to do just do something and then exactly. then you'll have you know something that you'll be the first mover then things will react to that and then you can act again and then there's like so it's kind of like an iterative approach to getting to the right solution um but you're right i mean i guess that's kind of like an algorithm right i think so too yeah so how, how i would describe that algorithm is if I don't know what to do, I'm going to take action. And that's, so if, if you're in a situation where you, when you're not sure what to do, then the output is I'm going to take action. And what action exactly depends on the situation. But that, that would be an algorithm that you build. And many people have a different algorithm. If I'm not sure what to do, then I paralyze. You know, right. that, then people don't make a decision. They don't take action or they're going to distract themselves. And I think it's interesting that you, you're so aware about this because I think it's a big strength, right? If you, you're not sure what to do, at least you take action. And it shouldn't be without thinking or it shouldn't be in a random direction, but I have the feeling that it's, that it's not for you. Okay, so going with your, your metaphor of, uh, this is fun, I'm having fun right now. This is, this is um, I, I'm feeling connected. I feel like, um, I feel bad for the audience because I'm like, I'm in hog heaven right now because you're exactly, I wanted to talk to someone about this. Um, so the algorithm one is action, is like, when I don't know what to do, I act. I think the new algorithm that I need to hard code into my life, which I'm totally speaking like, like data lingo here, um, is that when I don't know what to do, I pause and I think deeply about it. Actually that, well, uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's good because I, I think that you run the risk. Well, maybe it's like there are two algorithms and you don't run just one. Is that possible? Right. Yeah, how I see it is that you have many, many different alg algorithms. Mm -hmm. And this, this, this could be one of your algorithms. So if, if you see, if you don't know what to do, you will take action for sure. But if you notice, you always also see the results of those algorithms. So if you go back to the, the times you made a situation or you started mm -hmm. fighting quickly and, and go take action, if you're not happy with the results, thanks to that decision, then maybe it's time to, to take a step back and, and think, okay, what change can I make to my behavior? And 
so what I what, what I explain in the book is that if you if you want to change that algorithm, so say you're not happy with always taking action because it doesn't because you're too too much in a rush. You don't oversee things too first. Right. Yeah, too impulsive. Right. So if this is something you want to change, you can look at your own alg algorithms and see where when they are triggered. For example, when you're speaking to one of your entrepreneurial friends, they have an idea, you take action immediately and it will, it takes you too much time. So it's, it's distracting you. Then you need to become very aware of that certain situation so you can recognize it the next time. And that's, and that's very, that's very difficult because those algorithms are ingrained in your brain, right? That's why they're triggered automatically. But if you recognize the situation, and then instead of taking action directly, you can think about it and take a step back. Then once you've done that enough times, say 20, 50, 100 times, you're building a new behavioral pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's also when eventually, if you like enter that behavior uh, enough times, mm -hmm. then also the algorithm is gonna change. That's also what studies show. If you behave in a certain way enough times, then also your your algorithm or your brain is going to change as well, because that that's also why working out is so easy if you're in a pattern of working three out, times. Right. Exactly, and and if you haven't worked out in six months, it's it's a pain, right? Mm. And it's the same with these things. So that might be something worth exploring for you. Well, and may, let me know if I'm going way too deep with this metaphor, but have you ever heard of code switching? Do you know what code switching is? Code switching, no. Um, okay, this is a really fan f fascinating anecdote. Do you know who Quentin Tarantino is, the director? Yeah. So there's this YouTube video of him getting interviewed by different people, and he talks like that person, like in the interview, and it's like, it's almost like he doesn't have a stable person. Like he's just a shit. He's like shape shifting and like, not only is he um, like mimicking the person's like tonality and vernacular, but also like their body language. It's so fascinating. Can these algorithms be context dependent? Like, can I cuss around my entrepreneurship friends and then like pull it back when I'm in my professor frame, or is that because? It, the way that you're framing it up is that you're like programming your brain on how to respond to certain situations. Can you mm -hmm. differentiate between the same situations in different contexts? Yeah, 100%. Oh, okay. 100%. Because there's, there's many people that are very open and expressive when they're with friends. And then when they speak to a senior director, the oh. stage club, and that's so, so you have different algorithms, that's how I call them, for, for different situations. Okay. So with certain people, some people are very uh, expressive or more analytical. You have infinitely many, uh, many different personalities, of course. But I can say with, with very dominant personalities, I tend to uh, shut down a little. Oh, really? But with, with people who are more open, who are interested to show... Uh, you know, interest in, in me as well, not just blasting themselves, then I feel much more comfortable. So I think it's important for everyone, whether you work in data or not, to become more aware of your own behavior and thought patterns. Right. Because I've kind of started making some, so through the end of the year, you know, if we can sustain this, we're posting three YouTube videos and three podcast episodes a week. And in the Wednesday, the middle slot, so we're posting Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. In the middle slot, I'm starting to talk about my experience as an analytics consultant. And we kind of get into these like interpersonal exchanges and like power dynamics and like, because like a, a topic that I'm thinking about writing is, um, or, or making a video on and scripting is, should you negotiate your salary or should you, should you just start brand new with a new company? Um, it is, it is really interesting reflecting back because the, the anecdote I was going to share was that the first consulting client I, I got, I charged way too little and I tried to negotiate up and they fought me tooth and nail for a $2 raise to where I switched through like 
I don't know, a year later or so, I just sat down with the CFO and I was like, just said, oh, this is how much I charge. And it was five times that rate. And that was a, a seamless, effortless conversation. Uh-huh. It was just like, of course, like, like uh, that, that, that is fascinating. The, the whole interpersonal and the psychology behind it. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's one, uh, you trigger uh, a thought in my head. It's, you know, the anchor bias. Well, isn't that the, the, um, the tactic that Trump uses or has used in his presidency where I'm going to build a, I'm going to build a hundred foot wall and it's like, that's the anchor point. So then just saying, well, we're going to increase board security seems like really minor in comparison. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because then people think, well, it's, it's not that big of an issue. Well, right. and also in your situation where you, where you started, uh, charging, uh, not, not enough. It's so difficult to get that up. And also in, in negotiations, I think when you negotiate, negotiate your salary as a, as a data analyst or in analytics, it's, it's difficult if you start too low because then they have that as an anchor. Well, if you start a bit higher without saying 1 million, then, <laughs> then people have that as a, as an anchor and you're more likely to, to end up with a higher salary. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. So let me get back to that metaphor because I think the context does matter here. So I turned my, my, my last internship in my MBA into my first consulting client. So that was a person I tried to negotiate up with. Um, about a year, maybe two years later, I was giving a talk at my coworking space on Tableau and a CFO came to take my class. So I was in a position of power there where he was learning from me versus meeting me as an intern. So it's the framing of it really, like really, really matters, I think. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I agree with you. So, okay. Well, we, we've been rattling on for like 40 minutes now. So go out, you guys who are listening, go out and buy Gilbert's book because, I mean, you just saw it. He's amazing. He's so good with like the, the bridge between the, the hard skills and the, the analytic stuff and the communication side of things. And I would say that this is a multiplier for your career. Like if you can get the soft skills down, that might be the difference between 10 years being a senior analyst versus being a VP or even maybe a CTO of a company. So any, any last words before we sign off, Gilbert? I really appreciated this conversation. I think it was, it was cool that these types of conversations I enjoy the most where it's um, flowing, freely flowing. Right, as, right. And building points upon each other and wondering what would be the next question. Uh, I really enjoyed it. So thanks, thanks a lot for having me on the podcast and um, I hope people are going to enjoy it. Awesome. So go ahead and buy people skills for analytical thinkers and you want them to follow you on LinkedIn. You want, you want to build that, that following up there? Yeah, sure. People awesome. can always, always follow. Feel free to uh, follow me. I try to post some content around analytics and mainly on people skills. So if you're interested in that, then, uh, then let's connect. And I have an event coming up next week. If you're interested, you can also sign up. So, um, yeah. Again, awesome. uh, thanks you, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on.